Hello everyone, I am Dimitrios Papadopoulos. I work for the Chrome team here in LA. And this is the first time I'm in a JSLA meetup, so I'm really excited and thank you all for coming. Uh, so to do, today I'm going to be talking about Lovefield, which is the project I've been working on for about the last 10 months. And there's also some other Lovefield team members in the audience. I will not point them out until we get to the questions. Um, <laughs> so let's get started. Um, very briefly, I'm going to talk about the history of Lovefield and why did we start it. Um, then I'm going to show what exactly Lovefield, Lovefield is and what functionality does it provide. Um, we're going to have a little demo and we will do some live coding. And then if there is enough time, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how it works under the covers. And we will have questions at the end. So if you have any, um, please hold them until the end, uh, unless you're lost and, uh, or you can't see something or you don't understand. So feel free to interrupt me. Uh, let's get started. That's quite a lot. Uh, so back in November 2012, uh, my team started working on this large web application. It was actually a Chrome application, uh, Google Plus Photos for Chrome OS. And it had a very big data component. And one of the requirements was to be able to work offline and to also feel very fast when you navigate between the UI. Everything had to be very snappy, like a native application. So we started designing that app. We started from the data access layer. And it was obvious we would have to actually uh, persist some of the data in order to fulfill the requirements. So uh, we looked into the available solutions. And um, after we familiarized ourselves, we didn't really find any solution that was fitting well with relational data, which is what we, um, what we were dealing with. Uh, and at the time, we had to solve that problem. And we did solve it by building a domain-specific uh, data access layer. And it did work. It solved our problem, kind of. It was very hard to build it, hard to maintain, painful. And most importantly, we could not reduce that work for any other application because it was tailored for this specific uh, data set. Uh, so then the idea came to mind, what if we build a, uh, a generic structured data query layer for the web? And what if we solve that problem for everybody else and prevent developers from uh, hitting all the difficulties, that, uh, facing all the difficulties we faced building this application? And that's, what, that's how the Lovefield idea uh, got started. So what is Lovefield? If we had to summarize it in one sentence, a relational database management system is written in JavaScript and is using IndexedDB as a backend. Uh, and before I actually present uh, the functionality in more detail, I want to give some insight into um, some design choices that you might be asking in your head right now. Uh, why did we use IndexedDB as a backend? So we took a look, uh, we took a look at all the available uh, persistence APIs. And um, WebSQL is deprecated since November 2010. And if it was still around, we would probably not have started LabField. Uh, so this is not good. Uh, web storage, also known as local storage, has a 5 megabyte limit in most browsers. And that's not good for the applications that we're targeting. It's not enough. Uh, file API would be a very good candidate uh, for us to implement. But it's been the file writer interface from that API has been deprecated. So that's also not good. Uh, cookies, not really much to say. It's not really meant to support the whole DBMS uh, for various reasons. So not an option. Uh, on the other hand, IndexedDB is implemented in all major browsers. It's still actively maintained. Uh, and it has some really nice features like uh, atomicity. So we get atomicity for free by using IndexedDB. And it doesn't have the 5 megabyte limit. So this was our choice at the moment and still is. Um, another question we've been getting a lot is uh, why uh, is IndexedDB not good enough on its own? Why do we need to add this extra layer on top? Why don't we let developers interact directly with it? So we did that for two years almost. And we learned quite a few lessons. Uh, and here they are. First, uh, it's a low-level API. It's lower than uh, most developers, especially web developers, would want to interact with. It leads to hard to maintain and cluttered code, especially if you're dealing with an app that has a lot of data, like our case. Um, it has very limited querying capabilities. Uh, there is no table joins. There is no partial select or update. So if, you, if you're writing an object into the DB, you have to have the full object. Uh, if you're getting an object from the DB, you get all of it. You cannot just select a few fields. Uh, there is no filtering based on predicates. And 
there is no advanced sorting. So you can sort in one column, like you create a cursor, but if you want to like sort by this, and if there is a tie, sort by this other column, you cannot do it. Uh, in some way, this is expected because IndexedDB is an object store, so it's not really designed for relational data. So these advanced querying capabilities are missing by design. Uh, and finally, we learned about some uh, specification flaws. Um, I'm referring mostly to the transaction auto-commit behavior. If you have encountered it, you probably have felt the pain. If you haven't, it's basically when the message loop turns in JavaScript and you have a transaction in memory, if you haven't placed any request against that transaction, it will silently, in the background, commit. And then next time you try to use it, you will get back a nice error from IndexedDB and you will be debugging. Um, the other uh, specification flow we've identified is loading a lot of data into memory, uh, bulk loading. It's very slow and efficient, and that is because of the eventing scheme. So every row that you load into memory, there it, calls, it calls back into your JavaScript page, even if you don't have anything interesting to do. And um, we, um, we have a solution for that. So LaFill basically mitigates all those issues that we, uh, I just pointed out. So here are the main features. Uh, database related, um, LaFill offers an SQL-like API, and we will see that API very shortly in one slide. Um, select, insert, update, delete queries, just uh, like you have in SQL, if, if you are familiar. I'm assuming some of you will be familiar with SQL. Uh, the ACID database properties, this is atomicity, consistency, isolation, and the durability. Uh, it offers group by, order by, limit, uh, skip, and aggregators, just like you expect from SQL. Um, we have multi-table join and self-table join, and integrity constraint checks, and we, uh, LaField includes a query optimizer analyzer, which is actually a very big part of the internals, and we will see that at the last part of the talk, hopefully. Uh, some other characteristics, it's cross-browser, works on all major browsers. It's built as a component, so basically you can drop it in, no matter which JavaScript framework you've been using, and there is a lot of those. Uh, in the demo, we'll see we're using AngularJS. Um, it's closer compiler friendly. If you do happen to use the closer compiler, the code base of LaField is fully typed, so you can get meaningful errors and warnings and whatnot. Uh, we have a lot of test coverage, and we're open sourced on GitHub. So this is kind of a main overview of LaField. Uh, so let's see how to make LaField available in your page. Um, so it all starts with a schema file. The user, in this case a developer, has to um, has to provide a schema in the YAML format. The schema describes the structure of the data. So basically what tables are there, what columns are there per table, the types of each column, and any indices that you want to create and any constraints you want to place on those columns, not nullable, nullable, unique, not unique, etc. cetera. Uh, this is a very plain schema that I have here that has only one table and two columns and no constraints or indices. Uh, so you pass that schema to the schema parser and code generator, which is abbreviated as SPAC. And uh, basically what that does is generates a bunch of JavaScript classes for you, all in one file. Uh, the, mo the most interesting one is the, the one you see at the bottom, the get instance. This is basically how you open a DB connection, and this is how you uh, get access to the LaField API. Uh, you need a DB connection. Uh, so the other thing you need to include LaField in your page, it's uh, the LaField core library, which you get from the GitHub repo. You either choose the minified version or the debug version, and then you include them in your script, in your page, in that order, and you're ready to, ready to use love field. Um, so, okay, so finally, let's see how the API looks like. Um, I'm gonna be comparing SQL to love field. So on the left, I have a few SQL queries, uh, fairly simple. Select from, uh, star from player, where height greater than 200 centimeters. Um, uh, this is how it looks in love field. So if I had to read it, it would be, db.select from player, where player.height greater than 200, exec. So the color here depicts the equivalent parts between the two APIs, and LoveField does look and read very similar to SQL-like. That's why I said it's SQL-like before. Um, the main difference here is that on the left, we have free text, which means that there is a parser and needs to parse that text. On the right, we have declarative syntax. There is no parsing. Uh, it's basically a collection of function calls. We're using the builder design pattern, where you call objects on a builder until you're done. Uh, and then the exec method is basically executing the query. It returns a promise, and that promise gets fulfilled when the results are available. Um, 
another query, very similar in this case, we're selecting a specific column and we're ordering by height uh, in descending order. In LaField, this looks um, very similar to the previous one, except that select now receives an argument, uh, player.name. If you're wondering where this uh, object player comes from, it's from the generated code, and player is basically the schema of the table where uh, we are querying. Um, so, and then order by uh, parenthesis player.height lf order dot descending. lf is the namespace we've been using for uh, some operators that we have uh, because we don't want to pollute the global namespace. Uh, another query that has limit and skip, I won't go into detail because it looks very similar. The only difference is uh, limit 50, skip 100. If you were to implement pagination in one of your pages, you would use this kind of query to, to create those uh, pages. Um, all those queries have been dealing with only one table, so let's go to a little bit more complicated queries. So joins, uh, two tables at least. Um, I'm assuming I have a different schema here, um, employee and job relations, where employee has a foreign key on job. Uh, so e.jobid uh, e equals j.id, that's my join condition. So here I'm performing a join between the two tables and I'm uh, looking for a specific employee ID, ID 1234. Uh, in love field, uh, it looks uh, like you see on the right, DB select from employee comma job where and then I'm passing a composite condition, which I get it from LF op end, which is our end operator, uh, exec. So this is the implicit um, uh, join syntax. And there is one more syntax that is, uh, the, the queries are entirely equivalent. Uh, you see on the left, this is the explicit SQL uh, join syntax, and this is the explicit love field join syntax, where there is from still takes one table, but there is a new clause called inner join, and holds the, the table we're joining and the join condition. Uh, those queries are uh, equivalent. So the last example I want to show from the API is the self-table join. So because love field doesn't have subqueries, um, we took the time to implement self-table join. So basically some sub-queries, you can implement them as self-table joins. In this case, um, I, I have uh, pairs of jobs and I'm trying to find uh, pairs where job one has a minimum salary equal to job two, uh, equal to the maximum salary of job two. Uh, so in Love Field, uh, you need to create an alias before you actually build your query and that is done with the as call. So job.asj1 creates one alias and job.asj2 creates another one. And now I'm using those to build my query. Uh, db select j1.name, comma j2.name from j1, comma j2, where j1 means salary equal to j2 max salary exec. Um, so by this time, I'm hoping you start, start getting a little bit familiar with the API. What I'm also hoping is that for people who are familiar with SQL, the learning curve is really not steep at all uh, because it reads and looks very similar. Um, at this point, let's switch to the demo and actually see it a little bit in action. So for this demo, um, I really was hoping the resolution would be better. But uh, for this demo, I'm using a database of all Olympic uh, medals from 1896, basically the first uh, Olympic Games, modern Olympic Games, until 2008. And uh, if I open my console here, uh, you will see that in IndexedDB, is that big enough? Uh, there is one table called medal, and it has um, a lot of entries. You, you know, like I can, it's about 20,000 entries. And let me just open one just for fun. So it looks like this. It has city, color of the medal, country, uh, discipline, event, and other stuff, first name, last name, uh, and the year. So let's per perform a few queries. So first, I'm going to use that form that you see on the left to perform some queries. Um, let me scroll down a little bit. Uh, since the, the most prestigious event of the Olympic Games is the 100 meters, uh, I will select 100 meter, and I will try to find all the gold medalists uh, in that event. And let's pick men first. So I'm hitting search. And I'm getting all the results here. Let me scroll to the top. Um, this is resolution is very small, uh, but you see you see the results. So it starts from 1896, and it goes all the all the way down to 2008. You say in bold 2004 Justin Gatlin, etc. Um, if I go back on the left, you see here that I have a SQL version of the query we just executed. So Love Field has a two SQL method, so you can actually see the 
how your query would look like if it was SQL. In that case, it's like this. Uh, OK, you see it. Um, so let's switch to women. If I do a search, the results will update. Um, so Shelly, Ann Fraser, 2008, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so let's make it a little bit more specific. So let's actually find all medals from USA. Uh, and let's pick 200 meters instead of 100. Uh, OK, search. So I'm still looking at women. So anyway, the, the point is that the results update. And this is the last query I'm going to do from the UI. And we're actually going to go into the dev console and see uh, a little bit better what's happening. So I'm going to open the dev console now. OK. So conveniently enough, I have placed a global DB variable. This is my connection to the database. And with this, I'm very powerful. With this, I can do anything I want. So. Uh, First, I'm going to get the schema of the table I'm interested. Uh, db get schema dot get metal. Uh, OK. So metal now is the schema of the table I'm interested in. With this object, I can do queries. So let's find all the medals that Michael Phelps has gotten, um, famous swimmer. So this would look like that. db dot select from medal where I'm going to use the op operator because I need to bind both the first and the last name. So lf op end. Um, let me scroll a little bit. Medal dot first name dot eq Michael. Metal dot last name um, dot eq Phelps exec, and then when that is ready, I'm going to display the results, which is another global function I've placed. So the query executed and the UI updated. Let me close this for a second. So there's 16 results. So apparently Michael Phelps has 16 medals until 2008. And we see all of them. But there is a lot of information on this table. And I don't want to keep all the, co all the columns because they kind of distract me. So let's modify our query to actually include less columns. So let me bring it back up. Oops. All right. So now, instead of passing nothing to this select function, I'm going to say medal.year metal dot um, color and uh, let's select the city city uh, no let's select the event event so once I execute this uh, let me close this again so now we have a nice uh, table where only the things I'm interested in are actually being displayed and these are all the medals so let me specify it a little bit further let's say I'm only interested in gold medals um, I'm gonna open it up again very slight modification to what we have. I'm going to add one more clause in this end. Metal.color.eq uh, gold. Right. And I forgot one parenthesis, I think. There you go. So there's 14 gold medals. Um, so the next thing I want to show you before we go back to the presentation is how did you debug a query? Let's say it's slow, uh, something is not working, or how do we even ourselves debug LaField if it's not working? Uh, there is this explain method. So um, let me start from scratch. Let me actually uh, delete all that. OK, so I'm going to use the explain method uh, from metal. Dot where metal dot. Um, so I know that first name does not have an index. So if I search on first name, it's going to be a very slow query because I need to examine every single row in the table, which means I need to bring the entire table into memory. So if I do um, explain this query, 
I'm missing something. This, yeah, I'm missing the actual predicate. Uh, EQ, let's say Michael. OK, so when I explain this query, I get this textual representation of what the query execution plan looks like. And uh, we read those plans from the bottom up. So the first thing is the table access on the entire table. This will bring the table into memory. And then it's going to filter out all the rows that do not satisfy this value predicate. And then it's going to project it, uh, which in this case, we're not selecting any columns. So all the col we're selecting all the columns. So there's nothing to do at project. So if I change first name to last name, because I know I have created an index on last name, you will see that the plan looks very different. Um, the plan last name. So now what I'm getting is an index range scan on this uh, specific uh, last name column, which means only the rows that satisfy this predicate will bring, be brought into memory. And this is the second step, table access by row ID. This is a way more efficient uh, query execution plan. And this is how I would debug a very slow query. I would go back into my schema. I would add the index. I would test it again, and it would be faster. Um, and with that, um, I want to finish the demo. There is obviously way more I can show you, but we don't have much time. Um, so going back to the presentation. Um, I might have to go a little faster through those. So we're going to look under the covers. Uh, typical database management system. There is a query parser, a query engine, and query executor. The user provides the query in free text. It, it uh, is being parsed into a tree. Uh, this is being converted to a query execution plan. And the query execution plan basically describes exactly how to get the answer. And then the executor is, fine, is executing and returning the answer to the user. Uh, in love field, it's very similar. The only thing that is different is the query building instead of parsing, which it means there is no SQL injection risk for love field. Um, so I'm going to focus on the query engine, which is one of the most interesting components here. So remember that the input is query parse three and the output execution plan. So on my next slide, I have pre-filled those. There is a lot of stuff happening in between, and we're going to fill in the gaps really quickly. Uh, the logical plan generator generates a logical query plan that is basically a tree of uh, relational algebra operations. Uh, it's not optimized. That's why it's called draft. The logical plan optimizer, it's doing what's called uh, um, rule-based optimization. So it's just a heuristic rules that make the tree uh, more uh, faster to calculate. It outputs another logical query plan that is equivalent. And then we convert that plan to a physical query plan. This is more specific in the sense that all the algorithms and all the access methods have been specified. Uh, this is still draft. There is a second set of optimization, which is the cost-based optimization. This one actually takes into account all the indices that we have, the snapshot of the database, uh, how the data looks like at this particular moment, and it outputs the final query execution plan. So a very quick example. Uh, this is the schema we used before, employee and job. There is one foreign key on employee. And the query I'm going to show here is like find all employees, uh, find the name, salary, and job title of all employees that are less than 30 years old. And because the information I'm looking for is spread between two tables, I need to do a join. On the right, you see the, the draft logical query plan, the unoptimized. Uh, you read it from the bottom up. There is um, the two relations we are being fed into the cross product. This will generate a lot of rows, m times n rows, which is very inefficient. And then um, most of those rows will be thrown away at the next step. Then they're going to be ordered and projected. Um, so here, let's go really quickly um, between the, perform the, uh, the optimization steps. In red, you see the, the parts of the tree that have been transformed compared to the previous uh, state. So here, we, we break the composite uh, predicate into two predicates. So far, the tree is still just as uh, effective, efficient, because nothing has changed much. But this sets up really well for the next transformation, where I'm pushing down one of the predicates below the, co the cross product. Uh, what this does, basically, it makes the cross product uh, receive smaller input, and therefore the output, the output will be smaller. The intermediate results of my calculation will be smaller and less memory and less time needed. Um, the next step, I'm, I'm combining the, the other predicate, which is the value predicate right here, uh, with this uh, cross product. And I'm creating one node that is a, a join. So basically, this it will only join those employee rows that match the job ID from the other table. Um, and this is the end of the uh, rule-based optimization. So what is remaining is the cost-based optimization, really quick. This is the physical query plan. As I said before, it's very similar to the logical. But you see now that 
the relations do not magically appear in memory. There is a full table access at the bottom of the tree. And then the, the join that we, we talked about has been specified as loop join, a nested loop join. And there's other joins. The optimizer chose to use this one. So on the right, because uh, assuming that I have an index on this age field, um, the, op the optimizer can use an index to find all those rows that have age less than 30 and then bring only those rows into memory. So comparing this to our initial plan, uh, this is way, way much faster. And um, this is the end of the optimization for this example. So the point of this entire example is not to be a, a CS databases class here. Uh, the point is to kind of showcase that LabField does a lot of work for the developer, a lot of heavy lifting, low level work, what the developers would normally don't do, mostly because of time resources and maybe even some knowledge. It takes quite a bit of knowledge to do all those. Um, and this is what LabField provides um, to the user. And with that, I want to take to some future work items. We would like to integrate with the most popular JS frameworks. Currently on our roadmap is Angular and Polymer. Uh, we would like to improve our build, uh, our external workflow, build and test. It's a little bit rough right now on our GitHub repo. Um, we want to finish some missing spec features. Um, uh, composite indices, so indices on more than one column and foreign keys. Uh, and we have some other, but these are the, the biggest ones. Uh, we want to keep improving performance, which this is kind of a never ending goal, but we know there is a lot of work we can do. And uh, finally, we want to find some changes uh, in the web platform that can be done to remove some obstacles that we're facing today. Uh, specifically, right now, you cannot really open two DB connections from different tabs or from different windows that refer to the same database because our caching layer in between and all our indices getting out of sync, and we don't have a good way of syncing between them. Um, and with that, I'd um, like to thank you all for listening and ready to answer any questions. Yeah, so let me repeat the questions. If we support any kind of eventing when the data changes, if I understand, and what kind of types uh, does the schema? So let me start with the second one. We have number, integer, string. We have uh, array buffer, um, date time, and uh, I might be missing one. It's all on a spec. Um, an object, and we support plain object. Because basically, there's some restrictions on object and array buffer. You can obviously not index that column, but you can definitely have it in your data. Um, and uh, if we support, yes, we have this feature called observers. You can basically take a query and observe it. So the, the API looks like DB observe, and you pass a query, and then a callback. And every time the results of that query would change, you could get a callback. You, your callback will be called, which initially we thought about observing a table, but then we figured out that observing a query is more powerful. Um, and we do have that, but I had no time to talk about it. Just briefly, where does IndexedDB persist this, and can you save it, back it up, like the database itself? What's, what's going on behind the scenes there? So behind the scenes, LabField writes into IndexedDB. That's what I showed at the beginning of the demo, like all the data resides there. So if you can uh, copy to another DB, uh, I mean, you can read everything in, but every, dom every uh, domain has one IndexedDB uh, backing it up. You can create a different instance if you want, but it wouldn't really be backing up. I mean, we can add an export to JSON functionality. Um, yeah. But under the covers, we write to IndexedDB. So once your transaction commits, your data is there. Like You can close the application at that point, and next time you bring it up, it will be there. That's the durability part of the asset properties. Browsers isolating databases by domain. By domain, yes. So the maximum size of the database is the question. So um, I, I do not think all browsers have the same. Uh, I believe Chrome has a 50 megabyte limit, but you can extend that. I think it brings up an info bar and asks the user if you want to allow this app to store more. I'm not entirely sure on that. Uh, if you're writing a Chrome application, uh, which it was our case, you have unlimited. So basically, the system's disk space is your limit. Um, 
Uh, this Olympia, I think it's about 15 megabytes. Um, the demo is on our GitHub page. I don't remember. The JSON file is about 15 megabytes. Now, when you put that in IndexedDB, it's probably it's not exactly the same, but that's the order of magnitude. Um, so you guys are generating JavaScript code before you serve this. Uh, was there a reason you chose not to include the Lovefield library with the generated code? Um, yes, th there was. Um, so first of all, you might have you might be using Lovefield uh, in two like you might have two different schemas on the same page, or maybe you're using a component uh, that uses Lovefield under the covers and you're not aware of it. What we wanted to ensure is that you will not include Lovefield core twice because if we did it with the generation, then there will be duplicate code, and that was um, primarily why we separated them this way. Sorry. Yes. Um, what, um, yeah, so from your perspective, like as a developer, what, what is the workflow for, I guess, like syncing the data in the IndexedDB with like a greater database? Like for instance, if, like having Google Google Plus Photos, people's photos are you know in the in the Chrome app are, ba are backed up on their drive, but they're gonna want to be able to put that online as well. So like I guess what would be like that use case? Like how how is the database synced between the users users PC and then Google's database? <clears throat> so, I mean, the truth is that the browser does not have access outside of whatever it allows. Like, this is for security reasons. We cannot access um, a physical location on the user's disk. Um, so we cannot, like, take the data from, you know, from your C drive and put it in IndexedDB. What we can is we can take it from the server and put it in IndexedDB. So when you close it, when you lose the connection, you can still use the application. Uh, so it would have to go through the server to make it into index to be in that case. That's what, I, that's what I was asking is like, so you guys, so the, the DB itself, like your like, like love field doesn't have any, any visibility to another server or something like Yes, and th that, that's the security model of the browser. Same, if you're using the file system API, uh, there, is, there is no, um, it's not visible outside of your web browser. It's actually encrypted in disk and it's not visible. Um, that's because of security model. So then as a developer, you're responsible for syncing data from there to an to external database with just the browser. Yes, like in this example, for exa uh, in this example, I have all the Olympic medals in a JSON file, which I loaded up doing an XHR, and then I put it all in IndexedDB. And from that point on, there's just two separate things completely. All right. All right. Awesome. Thank you.